People have problems, don't they? We all do. I have them. You have them. Uh, the people around you have them. And there, and there comes that moment in life where sometimes we see people with problems and all we want to do is separate ourselves from it. Like, I don't want to deal with that. And, and, and there comes a time where we, we just want to go in the other room and close the door or, or maybe go outside the house or, or go out from the office to lunch or just go anywhere because we want to get away from people and their problems. We don't want to deal with it. And, and it's understandable because people and problems make life messy. One of the things you find out, the more you know people, um, the more they can cause problems for us. And, and sometimes we have ourselves are the ones that are causing the problems, aren't we? Sometimes we're the ones that are other people's problems, and yet sometimes we, we don't really look at it that way. Sometimes we want to we wanna elevate ourselves over everybody else and, and, and say we're better than everybody else, and, and, and then we want to push other people away because our approach to people is, is if I can't fix you quickly and make you everything I want you to be right now, I'm going to go over here and separate myself from you because I don't want to deal with your problems. I don't want to deal with your messes, and, and what that leads to is problems, not just for us, but problems for people. Because you see, that's not the way God intended his church to live. That's not the way God intended his body of believers to act. One of the things that we talk about a lot here at Evangel is this idea of discipleship. It goes back to what Jesus said as he stood outside of, of uh, Jerusalem just before he ascended to earth. He called all his disciples to him there. And he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. You know what comes next, right? Go therefore and make disciples. Go therefore and make disciples. You might have grown up with a, with a verse that says, go therefore and teach all nations. You, you know why? Because discipleship is teaching. Discipleship is teaching people this is who Jesus is, this is who God is, this is what he wants us to do. And, and, and so discipleship is following Jesus and helping others follow Jesus. Following Jesus and helping others follow Jesus. Do you understand if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have trusted in Christ for salvation, your responsibility is to be a disciple. You became a disciple the moment you placed your faith in Jesus for salvation. The moment you said, Jesus, I'm coming to you because i got no way to deal with my sin. You're the only one who can save me. Some of you have not yet done that. You're here this morning and you're hearing the preaching of the Word of God. And in fact, maybe this is a little bit weird to you. You know, a whole bunch of people get together in a big room and stand and listen to one guy you know, talk for a while. You might be used to this, maybe, maybe go to some motivational seminar or something for work. Somebody's trying to teach you to do something. Like, man, do this every week? That's just weird. And, and perhaps it is a little bit, but, but you know why we do this? Because we want to know who Jesus is. We want to know who God is. We want to know what he's called us to do. And you're here this morning because at some level you're interested in that. Maybe you're here and, and you've been thinking for a while, you know what, I, I, I need something in my life. Something's missing. I'm not quite exactly sure what it is, but I saw that church on the corner, and maybe I'll just drop in there and see. And, and, and I think you're here today by God's good grace. I think God is the one who's drawn you here, and today God may be at work in your life to show you that, that, that He came to deal with your biggest problems. And he is calling you to himself and giving you faith so that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, so that you can believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and give you eternal life and make you part of God's family. And maybe today you're hearing this for the first time or the second time or the third time, or maybe you're hearing it for the 50th time or 100th time, or whatever it is, but today is going to be the day you cross that line of faith and you believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. I want to tell you this, that's just the beginning. That's not the end. You see, the life of discipleship is a life of discipleship. It's not an act of belief. It's a life of following after Jesus. And one of the things you find out when you're around people in the church is that, is that we have a whole lot of differences. We come from all kinds of different places. We got people from all ages in here. I mean, from, from 90s all the way down to, to newborns. We have people from all different walks of life. Some of you are retired. Some of you are, are teachers and some of you are business people and some of you are, are factory workers and some of you are homemakers. We have people from all across the spectrum of occupations and, and life jobs. And, and, and we have people at all spots on the economic spectrum. Some of you have a, have a, have a, have a, a decent amount of money and some of you wonder where you're going to get dinner tonight. 
We're, we're all over the place. But God, by His grace, has called us together. And, and when we look around us, I, one of the things I want us to see in church is that we're all different. We're all different. And part of that difference is we all have different struggles and different difficulties in following after Jesus. Our lives are messy. We, we try to hide that, right? We, we, try to, we try to clean up a little bit before we come into church. And I don't mean clean up like we got up this morning, took a shower and, and kind of washed our hair and, and put on some decent clothes. And I mean, we try to, try to clean ourselves up morally and try to kind of hide behind a mask so nobody ever really knows who we are. You know why? Because we know we're a mess. And, and some of you, you look at people around you and sometimes you see, yeah, that person's really a mess. Hope they stay over there today because I don't want to mess with them. Maybe you hope nobody sees the mess you are. But here's what I want to show you this morning from the Word of God. Is that God has called you to get involved in people's messes. God has called you to get involved in people's message. When we, because this is what it means to make disciples. Look at verse number 14 in 1 Thessalonians 5. This is the only verse we're going to look at this morning. Verse number 14. Remember in these verses, Paul finished up this book, 12 through 22. It's just a series of commands. And, and we're going to walk through these commands. He's telling church, these are some things you need to do. And here it is in verse number 14. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. There are three groups of people here. All right, what are they? The unruly, the faint-hearted, and the weak. And there are three commands, three ways to address them. You admonish some, you encourage some, and you help some. And you be patient with everybody. And some of you sat there this morning and said, yeah, I'm glad we have a pastor to do that. That's a pastor's job. In fact, your first thought when you hear somebody struggling, your first thought is, let me email a pastor and, and say, hey, pastor, you need to call on so-and-so because they really need some help. You, you need to go and visit them. You need to make a phone call and try to, try to see if you can straighten them out. And you know what? If you do that to me, you know what my response is going to be? Yeah, you know, I agree. I think they need a visit. Why don't you go visit them? Why don't you make a phone call? Well, that's the pastor's job, isn't it? And the answer is no. Let me show you this. Look at verse number 14. We, that's Paul... As an apostle and his companions, uh, uh, Silas and Timothy, we urge you. That word urge there is a strong word of exhortation. It, it's, it's, it's almost a command. It's almost a, a demand. I am telling you, this is what you have to do. But he puts it in the words of encouragement because he wants to, he wants to come across and say, hey, I'm encouraging you. I'm pushing you to do this. Now, notice the next word here because this is the word some of you won't like. It's the word Brethren. You don't like it because you think this is a pastor's job. You know what that word is not? We urge you pastors. He had that word. He did not use it. In fact, this word brethren, he uses 19 times in the book of 1st Thessalonians. Five chapters, he uses the word 19 times. And every single time, you know who the brethren are? It's the church. It's not me. It's not Pastor Jerry, not Pastor Stephen. It's not even the deacons, as good as those deacons are, usually. I'm kidding, they're good all the time. It's not even the Sunday school teachers. Every single time he uses the word brothers or brethren, he's talking about the congregation. In other words, this is for you. Now, it's also for me because I'm part of the congregation. I, I'm, not, I'm not sitting way up high over everybody else. I'm elevated by about four steps this morning to make it easier to see. But I'm one of the congregation too. And, and so this does not exclude me, but it does not exclude you. This is something for all of us this morning. This is something we all must do. It's our responsibility as Christians. So we look around this morning, you know, there's people all over the place in their spiritual journey with Christ. Again, some of you are brand new. Some of you have been walking with Christ for decades. But every single one of us know this. Well, let's start with the first group this morning. Verse number 14, we urge you, therefore, brethren, admonish the unruly. 
What in the world is an unruly person? Here's the way we describe it this morning. This is a military term that, that was used with respect to military. And it, it was used with respect to those who are, who are out of rank. They're, they're not marching properly. You know, when, when you're in a, in a marching band or in the military, you're supposed to march in, in certain order, right? And, and, and right next to each other and in line with each other and step in the same way. And, and, and maybe you were in the military. Maybe you've seen somebody who a little bit out of step. Or maybe they're a whole lot out of step. This was a term for those who were disorderly, a term for those that were not in order. Maybe, maybe there were those who had deserted. Maybe there were those who simply were not doing the job that they were supposed to do. They're unruly. They're out of order. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, it may have been people who were lazy. Turn over just a moment to 2 Thessalonians. Let me, let me show you some. Just a couple pages, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at verse number 6, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, a a life that's out of order. Now, notice how he defines the life that's out of order. You see it there in verse number 6? An unruly life, not according to the tradition which you receive for us. Now, the tradition he's talking about here is not, you know, hey, we do the same thing every week. That's not the tradition. The tradition he's talking about is is the commands about how to live the Christian life, the commands about what they should do with the church. Now, here's what he's saying. There are some of you in this church at Thessalonians, at Thessalonica, there are some of you who are unruly. You're not living in obedience to what we told you God expected you to do. You're not living according to the revelation, according to the tradition that was passed down. You are disobedient. He goes on down in verse number 11. We hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life. You know what that word undisciplined is? It's the same word that's translated elsewhere unruly. They're undisciplined. They are not doing what they are supposed to do. Doing no work at all. Acting like busybodies. These are people who were disobeying God. Apparently, there were some at Thessalonica. They heard this, man, hey, Jesus is coming back soon. Hey, if he's coming back soon, <laughs> what do I need a job for? I'll just quit and wait for him to come back. But you know what happened the next day? They didn't go to work, but they still needed food to eat. And so what did they do? Well, they went to Deacon so and so. hey, you got food, don't you? <laughs> Let me eat your food. Paul said, no, no, no. If you don't work... You don't get to eat. You are not obeying God. Now, here's the unruly person, somebody who has heard the commands of God and refuses to obey them. Somebody who has heard the commands of God in Scripture and they refuse to obey them. They're walking outside the commands of God. Some of you are there. You know what God says. You know what you should do. You just don't do it. In fact, most likely, if you're unruly, you're not even struggling with it. You're not not fighting. You would say, yeah, I know what I'm supposed to do, but doesn't matter. (laughs) God's got grace. God's going to forgive all my sins. I'm going to use it all. That's you. You're hard-hearted. You're out of order this morning. You're walking in disobedience to God. You're not struggling. I've said often, I don't worry about people who struggle. I'm not saying I'm glad you struggle. Struggling's hard. That's why they call it struggling. If it wasn't hard, they'd call it something else. Struggling's hard, but I don't worry about people who struggle. I worry about people who've quit. The unruly person is somebody who has quit. They're walking outside the commands of God. And when you do this, you are endangering yourself spiritually And you are harming the reputation of Christ in this church. How many of you, maybe you work with somebody who who goes to church and you know what they're like in the office? Like, (laughs) yeah, I'm glad they don't go to my church. Right? That's an unruly person. They know what God has said to do, and they are refusing to do it. What do we do with unruly people? Look at the words there again in verse number 14. We admonish them. You might have a translation that says something like warn. 
The, the word means to warn. It's the same word used in verse 12, to give them instruction. That, that's a pastor's job, to give instruction. That's the word to admonish or to warn. It is to teach with a view of correction. In other words, here's the job. When we see somebody who is walking out of line, we are to warn them, you better get back in line. Here are the danger, here are the consequences if you continue down this road. The focus is to express disapproval. Again, that runs contrary to our lives today. Then we're like, hey, who are you to judge me? Hey, I got a verse on that one. Right? We don't want people speaking into our lives. You don't have any right to talk to me. But the word here has a negative confrontation, a negative connotation. We are to confront those who are rebellious to the teaching of Scripture. We are to try to end their rebellion and bring them back to the way of God. Now, what's the basis on which we do this? Some of you say, ah, I think you're doing wrong. Hey, if you're going to go and admonish the unruly, you better have something more than I think. Okay? All right, I don't, I, this is Sunday morning. This is our anniversary Sunday, and I don't want to be unnecessarily rude this morning, but most of us don't care what you think. If you're going to tell me I'm doing something wrong, you better have more than I think with it, right? What should you have? You better have the Word of God. That's why He gave it to us. We, we, we have to use the Scriptures to determine what the tradition that we have received is. Remember that word in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, the tradition we've received? That is the commands about how God wants us to live as believers. We need to warn people. Listen to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You know what it means to admonish the unruly? Say, listen, you are in danger of being hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You've just accepted it. And the moment you accept sin, you bought into the lie that sin doesn't matter. The moment you quit struggling, you bought into the lie, eh, it doesn't matter anymore, I'll just do it. And one of the things that we're supposed to do is to warn those people. Now, how do we know when somebody's unruly? We know an unruly person because we know Scripture. We know what God has commanded for us. We know what God has told us to do. It cannot be merely your opinion. Not for somebody else. Now, you as a believer, you must live by your conscience. And you have to have your conscience trained by the Word of God. But you have no right to expect somebody else to live by your conscience. What we do have is the Word of God. There may be places where we apply wisdom, where we take what God has said and explain it. But God is the standard, not you. How do we know an unruly person? Because we know Scripture. How do we warn an an unruly person? We warn them with Scripture. Bring the Bible. This is what God has said. To to quote the prophet, this is the way. Walk in it. Use Scripture. But, But we must do it with humility. We have to do it with prayer. We have to do it with commitment. You see, here's the number one danger, I think, of warning unruly people, is you will attempt to warn somebody you have no relationship with. You will attempt to warn somebody you have no relationship with. You're like, I don't know you from Adam. Why are you telling me that? I, I as a pastor, Pastor Jerry, Pastor Steve, we may be one of the few who can get away with it because our position as pastors has given us a little bit of, a, a little bit of an edge. On but, but when you go to somebody who you've seen three times across the auditorium, you go, hey, I think you're living in sin. You know what the response that's going to be? It's not going to be good. You know why? Because you have no relationship with him. See, here's what you have to understand about the church. The church is a body of believers, and we are to have relationships in the body. All of you, at some point in your life, you have been confronted by somebody you have no respect for, somebody you have no relationship with. And your word to them is, I'm not listening to you. But you also know that there's people in your life, most likely, you'll listen to anything they have to say. You might not agree with them, but you're willing to listen to them. You know why? Because you know them and they know you. 
There are people like that in my life. There are people in my life that I don't have the time of day for. So it's nobody in this room. Okay, don't misunderstand me. <laughs> but, but there are people, they can say something like, I don't care. But there are people in my life who I will listen to anything they have to say because I know they care about me. You see, at the heart of warning an unruly person has to be a relationship of love and commitment in the body of Christ. You've got to care about people. The problem with so many people is we don't want to be known. No, we don't want to know others. Why? Because that involves commitment. The moment I know you, I've got to invest in that. I've got to do all that stuff. And I don't really want to do all that stuff. And, and so I withdraw. Listen, some of you this morning, you're walking unruly. And somebody in this church that you know well enough needs to come up to you and say, man, you got to listen to Scripture. Look at this verse. Look into what God, listen to what God says. you got to do this differently. And when somebody comes up to you and does that, you know what you need to do? You need to listen to them. You need to listen. Don't just push them away. You might get a little upset. That's okay. It's okay. Don't take it out on them. You know why? Because they're obeying God. They're obeying God. Don't push them away because they obey God. You might disagree with them. Go back to the Scriptures. Warn the unruly. If you're unruly this morning, you need to repent. Here's my public wor word of warning for you. Do not continue to walk outside the boundary lines of God's tradition that He's given to us in His Word. Don't continue to disobey God. Come back. You know why? Because if you continue down the wrong path, there's a lot of pain and danger and agony down that road. But if you'll come back to God, there's a lot of forgiveness. Come back and receive that forgiveness. Maybe the reason why churches are so weak today is because it's always somebody else's job. You see somebody who's, who's sinning and you're like, eh, not my job. Let somebody else deal with it. No one is willing to take the scriptural responsibility of warning those who are living disorderly. We must do it. Warn the unruly. There's a second group of people mentioned here in verse number 13. I'm sorry, verse number 14. It's, it's the faint-hearted people. Who are faint-hearted people? Faint-hearted people are not unruly. Faint-hearted people are, are those who are discouraged. They're worried. The, the word here is literally a word that means small-souled. It, it's two words put together, compound words, small-souled. These are people who would say they, they have a tiny heart. They don't have a big heart that's always looking for adventure and always ready to go. These are people, um, you know, a feather falls off a bird and they're scared to death by it. They're, they're just, they're timid about everything. They're, they, they don't have courage. They're not unruly people who are willfully disobedient. They're, not, they're just not naturally bold people. They can be people who are overwhelmed by the stress of life. It might be adverse circumstances that come, maybe personal struggles they face. Maybe they have a deep consciousness of their own sinfulness. They're just timid. They're faint-hearted. The least little bit of spiritual stress is going to push them over the edge. There may have been those in chapter 4. Remember those people in verse number 13 who were, who were grieving as those who had no hope? Those were small-souled people. They, they didn't understand. They, man, my, my loved one died. I'll never see him again. Oh, no. And, and Paul writes, no, 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 you're going to see him again. In fact, they're going to get there first. He, he encouraged them. He encouraged them. It, these are people who are kind of, kind of melancholy about life. It, it, it might be just who their personality is. You ever been around people like that? They're just, they're just melancholy people. They're, they're just, they're just small soul people. I, I remember one of one of our hymns, old hymns of the church. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty sins. You know that was written by a man who almost could not bear life. He was so depressed constantly in his life. And it wasn't because he was living an open, hard-hearted rebellion against God. It was because he just struggled. And yet some of the greatest hymns of our Christian faith have come from people who were, in the words of the text, small-souled. And yet somebody came along to encourage them. What do we do with these people who are small? It's all these people who are timid, these people who, who seem weak. We encourage them. 
This word encourage in verse number 14 is used in John 11. You know what John 11 is? Sure you do. Maybe you don't know by John 11, but remember the story of Jesus' friend Lazarus? And, and Lazarus is Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and, and, and Lazarus was sick, and Mary and Martha sent a message to Jesus saying, Jesus, Lazarus is, is, is sick. He's about to die. You've got to come. And if you remember John 11, Jesus waits two more days. His friend is so desperately sick that Jesus had ah, two days. And by the time Jesus gets there, Lazarus is dead. And Mary and Martha are crushed. In fact, Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. And John chapter 11 uses this word of what the Jews did to Mary and Martha. They consoled Mary and Martha in the midst of their hurt, in the midst of their discouragement over the death of their brother Lazarus. There were people who consoled them. That's what this word is. To encourage the faint-hearted is to console them, to comfort them. You know, what's interesting here is we don't warn those who are faint-hearted. You ever been around somebody who's weak and, and downcast? You, you better straighten up right now. How's, how's that going to work? Maybe, maybe somebody's done that to you before. Like, what do you mean straighten up? I'm barely awake right now. It doesn't work. You know why? Because faint-hearted people don't need to be warned. They need to be encouraged. This is a, a tender concern. They need the kindness of God. What's interesting is oftentimes this kindness comes out of our own lives. Now, when you're dealing with faint-hearted people, it's probably not best to leave, oh, yeah, I know just what you're experiencing. You know why? Because you don't know what they're experiencing. You don't know what it's like for them. There's a writer of old, his name is Albert Barnes, he said this, every Christian has a fund of experience that is the property of the church for ministry. You've had some, some experiences in your life where God has come to you and he has encouraged you. And now you can take that and encourage others. I got a verse for that one. 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of our mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our afflictions, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves were comforted. That's a lot of comfort in there. Did you follow all that? There were times in, in our lives where we struggled and God comforted us so that now I can comfort others with the same comfort I got comforted with. I have a fund of experience. You have a fund of experience, like a bank account full of your experience of God's comfort. And when somebody's faint-hearted, you can go put your arm around them and say, hey, we're in this together. Let me strengthen you. Let me, let me encourage you. Don't give up. Remember Peter? He denied Christ. And he went out, the gospel writer tells us, and he wept bitterly. You know what I'd do to Peter? I got a really big hammer. You deny Jesus, we're coming down. In fact, I might have two hammers for that. You know what Jesus did? He looked at him across the courtroom. And Peter went out. Wept bitterly. He returned to his old life of fishing. And then Jesus shows up. And he comforts him. And he encourages him. Because he already told him, Peter, you're going to deny me, but then you're going to be converted. And when you're converted, you're going to strengthen the brethren. And so he comes to Peter after his resurrection. He says, Peter, feed my sheep. You see, Peter didn't need a big hammer. Peter didn't even need a little hammer. Peter felt greatly the weight of a sin. What he needed was encouragement. There are some people in our church, they're struggling. How do we know when someone is faint-hearted? The answer is because we know them. We know people well enough to say, hey, I see you're, I see you're struggling. It looks like you're having a hard time. It might be due to their personality. We know somebody who's, who's normally pretty upbeat, and all of a sudden they're several weeks in a funk. And you're like, hey, there's something wrong, right? 
Maybe it's due to circumstances we know nothing about. Or maybe it's due to circumstances we do know something about. But at the end of the day, we know who is faint-hearted because we know them. One of the dangers that we face is we don't know people well enough. And people don't know us well enough. But when we know people, we'll know when they're faint-hearted. And we'll be able to see and we'll be able to encourage them. And the goal of encouragement is perseverance. Keep walking. Don't give up. You might not be walking as fast as everybody else is. That's okay. You might be walking really slow. In fact, one person put it this way. Sometimes it's just enough to have your feet pointed in the right direction. Just don't give up. Persevere. People who are faint-hearted don't need warning. They need encouragement. Who's the third group of people? They're weak. Who are the weak people? It could be those who are physically weak by sickness, those whom the, who, whom the pressures of, of the physical body have come down on them, and, and they might need help physically or materially. It might be those who are socially weak, that is, they, they were slaves or maybe ex-slaves who, who didn't have the social status. It, it could be those. Um, and those are people who need our help. It's probably, it's probably those who are spiritually weak. Those who are facing struggles spiritually, they, maybe they don't know what God's will is. Maybe they do know, and they're not sure they can trust God with it. Maybe, maybe they lack courage to face persecution. Maybe, maybe they find it hard to control the appetites of the body. Maybe, maybe they face temptation with sin, and, and they don't have the strength to resist. They're weak. They're they're still being influenced by the beliefs of their old life. Now, these people, they're not quite unruly yet, but they're on the verge of it. You see, somebody who's struggling with sin, somebody who's weak with temptation has a choice. They can go towards God and say no. It's going to be hard. Yeah, it's going to be hard. It's going to be a struggle. It's going to be difficult. The other alternatives, they can give in to it. And the moment they start giving in to that temptation without repentance is when they cross the line over into unruly. These are not people who are unruly yet. But they're headed that direction. What do we do for these people? The word is help them. Be concerned about them. Hold them up. Don't abandon them. Struggle with them. There's an idea of accountability. Be part of the solution. Be part of their lives. What's the difference between the faint-hearted and the weak? The faint-hearted are discouraged. The weak are in danger. The faint-hearted are probably naturally kind of that way. They, they don't, they're not naturally the bold person. The weak are spiritually weak. Now, how do we know when someone's weak? The answer is because we know them. We know them well enough to know what their struggles are. We know them well enough to know where their difficulties lay. We see it in their lives. And God says, get involved. When you see somebody who's weak, you need to help them. When you see somebody who's, who's wrestling with temptation, you need to help them. You can't help somebody from a distance. Now, I, when I say distance, I don't mean a spatial distance like they live two miles away and therefore I can't help them. I mean a personal distance. You have to be available to them. You have to make yourself available to them. You have to be loving enough to be involved in their lives. There are some people in our congregation who are struggling with sin. There are people who are struggling with temptation. And you know what they need? They don't need you to laugh at them. They don't need you to mock them. They don't need you to talk about them in your Sunday school class or your prayer group. They need you to come alongside and say, I love you. Let's do this together. I'm willing to be a part of the solution. I'm willing to walk alongside you. Let's go. And when they are weak, like I can't go anymore, you're going to stop and sit with them. 
until they're ready to go again. And you're going to walk through life with them. Many times the weak people are the ones we want to we want to abandon. They're the ones we would say, well, <laughs> you don't want to go? Okay, go. you're on your own. I'm, no. But, but those are times when we can't abandon them. We have to help them. We have to walk alongside them through life. We're called to get involved. Admonish the unruly when somebody's walking outside of God's word. You've got to get involved by warning them about the dangers of continuing down this road of unruliness. When, when, when somebody is, is faint-hearted, you've got to comfort them and console them. When somebody is weak, you've got to help them. You've got to strengthen them. Above all, verse number 14, you've got to be patient with everybody. You have to have an even-tempered response. Don't be too quick to jump on somebody. Don't be quick, too quick to walk away from somebody. You see, ministry is a long-term project. People change slowly. You're one of them that's changed slowly, right? We all are. We, we change slowly, and it takes time, and it takes commitment, and you have to stick with it for the long haul. And, and sometimes when we're trying to, t- trying to minister to people and trying to help people, we want to get it. well, you're not changing fast enough. I'm going to go over here because they want to change more. I'm just going to leave you alone. You can't do that. You have to be patient. This is one of the characteristics of God, the Lord. The Lord God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. Don't you like that about God? Don't you like the fact that God is patient with you? So why don't you give that to somebody else? Well, I'm not God. You're right. All the more reason you should give them patience. If God can give them patience, why can't you? Be patient with everyone. Those who are struggling, be patient with them. Those who are hard-hearted, be patient. Ministry's hard. There will be people who, who will reject your help. You'll, you'll try to get involved in their lives, and they won't want it. Jesus did tell his disciples at one point, when you go to a city and they don't receive the gospel, shake the dust off your feet and move on. There does come a place where, where, where we walk away. But you're not there yet, most likely. And so we need to warn the unruly and, and encourage the faint-hearted and help the weak with, with patience. Now let me ask you a question. Why don't we do this? Let me give you four real quick reasons. Number one, one reason we don't do this is because of our tendency towards isolation. We don't want to be involved in other people's lives and we don't want other people involved in our lives. We want to be unknown. You are perfectly willing to sit here today and listen to me, so long as nobody knows what's really going on in your life. You want to be isolated. You want to hide. You don't want to know people because you know it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you emotion. Let me tell you, when you start warning the unruly and encouraging the faint heart and helping the weak, you are going to spend yourself emotionally. You don't want that. It's going to cost us materially. It's going to cost us time. No, we don't want that. We have a built-in tendency towards isolation. There's actually a word we use for it from the Bible. You know what it is? Selfishness. My life's about me, and the more time I spend having to help you, is less time I can spend helping me. We want to be isolated from others. Listen, we answer that tendency towards isolation by recognizing the nature of the church as the body of Christ. We are supposed to be connected to others. There's a reason why we're all here this morning. Listen, you could sit at home and listen to preaching, then you probably find some better preaching somewhere. But you can't have relationships that way. You need people. I need people. We need people. We have to know people. Our tendency towards isolation is answered by recognizing that we are part of a body and we need those relationships. We have to know people. You will never gain the ear of somebody you don't really know. They'll just push you off. They'll ignore you know people. You don't need to know everybody. Remember I've used the Lego block thing before? All right. Um, Lego blocks, they have a certain number of connections on them. And once that block is full, guess what? You can't add any more blocks onto it. That block is full. But there's a sense in which we as people are like Lego blocks. We can only have so many connections. Some of you can have 10. Some of you can have two. But you better have what you can have. Why? You need to know people. Don't be isolated. Let somebody speak into your life 
and you be willing to speak into somebody else's. Here's the number two reason, our tendency towards fear. One of the, second, the second reason we might not do this is because of fear. How are they going to respond to us? What if I say something to them and they get mad? What if? Well, what if I say something and they never talk to me again? Chances are they weren't talking to you before. But we have this fear. A fear about how it's going to respond. How, how are they going to do this? What, what's going to happen? How do we answer the tendency towards fear? And the answer is with conviction. We have to be convicted that this really matters. That somebody we care about has something going on. And God has placed me in this place at this time for this reason. And I am convic- convinced that if I don't say something, I'm going to be disobedient to God. The way you answer fear is with conviction. Conviction enables us to overcome fear. When you are convinced this is the command of God, and when you are convinced that God has placed somebody in your life so that you can either warn them or help them or or encourage them, you're going to find a way to do it. Not because it's going to be easy. It'll be hard. But you've got to do it. Answer fear with conviction. A third reason we don't do this is because of apathy. It's somebody else's life, and we're not really that worried about it. Yeah, I saw they sit way on the other side. I don't really know them that well and really care. Connected isolationism, you don't know anybody well enough to care about them. And you don't know anybody well enough for them to care about you. It's kind of like uh, some of you stopped caring about college basketball last night, didn't you? Some of you stopped caring last weekend. Now, whoever's playing money, it's just two schools from another state. We don't care about them, right? And that's the way we approach relation. Eh, it's somebody else's. Not mine. I don't care about it. How do you answer apathy? And the answer is, you recognize that God has commanded us to love, to care. Don't be apathetic. When you see a fellow believer who's struggling, that's part of our family. Fourth reason is a tendency towards hypocrisy. What if they find out I have the same problem? You do it too is always a good comeback, but it doesn't change reality. You do it too means we're both sinning. means we're both struggling. What's the answer? Be known. You hypocrite? Yeah, I'm a hypocrite. To quote somebody else, I am not as good as my right belief should make me. When I come to somebody and say, hey, I think maybe you got a sin problem. You know what? I have sin problems. I'm not perfect. If I was perfect, I'd be dead. You wouldn't be listening to me. We all have a measure of hypocrisy. Own it. Fight it. Know people. Follow after Jesus. Where do you start? Start with yourself. Know your own temptations. Know your weaknesses. Don't be unruly. Counsel yourself first. You're weak. Strengthen yourself with the Scriptures. Preach the Gospel to yourself. But realize that won't be enough. Because God has given us a church. Start with yourself. Do it in your family. Some of you, you know, you start there. It's part of marriage. Be careful with the warning part in your marriage, okay? Be generous with the help. Be generous with the encouragement. Be careful with the warning. But understand, our homes are one of the primary places God has given us to carry out this command. Do it with your children. This is part of parenting. It's those who know you best. Is it dangerous? Sure, it's dangerous. They know us far better than anybody else does. But if you think it's dangerous to do it, you should try the danger of not doing it. When you leave an unruly person unworn, they continue down that pathway, and it gets worse, not better. Start with those who know you well, and then be known and know people in your church. This this verse is not a call for you to be the church mother. Okay? You don't need to be watching over every single person trying to figure out everything that's going on. It's a call for you to know people. One, two, three, know people. Don't become the busybody who has to know what's going on in everybody's life. Don't, don't become the, the self-appointed Holy Spirit who set out to correct everybody. Just live with the people you know in the church. Know and be known. Be willing to do it. Be willing to have it done for you. But brethren, sisters... Let us admonish the unruly. Let's encourage the faint-hearted. Let's help the weak. Let's be patient with everyone. It's what God's called us to do.
It's what it means to be a church. Let's do it together. Following Christ, being disciples. Our musicians are going to come. We're going to close this morning with song. Lord, I need you. We need him for us. But we need him for you. We need him for each other. And as we come to close this morning, let us confess to God, Lord, I need you. And then let's take that need of Christ and communicate that to others and be used as instruments of Christ to help other people follow him. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, you've called us to be a church. You've called us to be a part of your church. And you've called us to love each other. And so we may, may we be faithful. May we be courageous. May we be convinced that we are to warn the unruly, to encourage the faint-hearted, to help the weak, and to be patient with everyone. Lord, we need you for this. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Stand together with me as we sing.